this is a drawing of, of an animal cell. Right? So it has various parts, such as the nucleus, where the DNA is. It has the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, which makes proteins. It has mitochondria, which generates energy in the form of ATP. And it has, of course, lysosomes, which is the recycling center of all cells. Lysosomes were discovered by this gentleman here, uh, Christian de Duve, and he got a Nobel Prize for that in 1974. Uh, and the main feature of lysosomes is that they contain enzymes which can break down pretty much any type of biological macromolecules that are delivered to them. And these enzymes work at an acidic pH. So there is a proton pump which sends protons into the lysosome through its limiting membrane to make them work. Okay? And this is an old textbook image of picturing various ways of, 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 uh, of pathways that can deliver, that can get things into the lysosomes for degradation and recycling. The first pathway I will mention is um, autophagy. This is a pathway for degradation of self material, what the, what the cells have inside them. This can be proteins, lipids, organelles, such as mitochondria, pretty much anything. Well, the next two pathways are uh, endocytosis and phagocytosis, uh, which means the breakdown of foreign material, particles taken up from, ex from the extracellular space and being degra degraded in lysosomes. And this is the last pathway I'd like to mention. This is called crinophagy. This is the breakdown of normally secreted material. Secretion means released from the cell into the extracellular space. And all these pathways that bring cargo to lysosomes uh, rely on vesicle fusions. So lysosomes fuse with, fuse with autophagosomes, phagosomes, endosomes, and secretory vesicles. Now let's take a look at the first one. This is autophagy. Um, last year, uh, Professor Osumi got the Nobel Prize for discovering the evolutionally conserved set of ATG genes and proteins that are required for the formation of these transport vesicles called autophagosomes, which deliver self-material to lysosomes. Okay? And he made this discovery uh, in 1993, actually. So it, Usually takes a long time to get a Nobel Prize. But it, this is in recognition to the importance of autophagy for health and disease. And I will il illustrate some of this through our uh, research. But for that, I need one more introductory slide. So we mostly use Drosophila as a popular animal model for genetic cell biology, developmental biology, and even for disease. You all know this animal. This is called the fruit fly, which is often surprising that you can u actually use fruit flies to mo model what's happening in our body. But its fruit fly body is surprisingly similar to our body. For example, it has a brain, which is uh, composed of a network of 100,000 neurons. Uh, here you can see some uh, uh, neuron terminals throughout the brain, and they collaborate for learning, uh, memory, be behavior, sleep, vision, so all these complex things that flies can do. And actually this year, two Drosophila researchers got the Nobel Prize for, for fig figuring out how the circadian rhythm works, how we know whether it's day or night, and how we behave during the day and the night. Now fruit flies also have a gut, the intestine, like we do, and the cells in the intestine are, are continuously renewed. Through the division and maturation of intestinal stem cells, all these little green dots that you probably don't see because there is too much light in this room, but all these little dots are along the intestine of the fly gut, just like in, in, in the case of our gut. And the third example I'm going to mention is that there are blood cells in flies which recognize and engulf bacteria. They also attack parasites. 
They are really these antimicrobials, and they can, they can make their blood clot. So just like our blood in many ways. And again, six years ago, a Drosophila researcher got a Nobel Prize for figuring out how these innate immunity pathways are activated. So the first slide, this is about the brain and autophagy. So a number of years, actually a decade ago, we published a study where we, uh, where we generated the first uh, autophagy gene mutant flies. We just deleted one of these ATG genes. And of course, this resulted in defects in autophagy. But also these flies were very sensitive to starvation. That's a very important thing. If you starve, if you don't eat food, your cells will use autophagy to recycle what they have to survive. So without autophagy, you are not able to survive starvation. That's what's happening in these flies and also yeast and every, every cell, every eukaryotic cell that has autophagy. So, and they very quickly develop neurodegeneration, meaning that cells in their brain die quickly. And as a result, they have a short lifespan. And um, of course, they also develop movement defects, which is also called ataxia. Now, is that important? For many years, it wasn't clear, but last year we collaborated with, uh, uh, with human geneticist colleagues working in the US. And they found a family uh, uh, in a small Turkish village where two boys inherited a mutation in one of these ATG genes, ATG5. This is one amino acid change. And these boys uh, have neurodegeneration, ataxia, and mental retardation. So ataxia is the movement disorder. Um, so th they were born into a family of second cousins. Right? So it's generally not a good idea to marry your relative. And that's why these isolated small Turkish villages are a gold mine for human geneticists, looking for, you know, rare diseases. So now, then we introduced the same mutation into Drosophila and looked what's, what's happening. And of course, happily, we were happy to see that, that these flies also have neurodegeneration and ataxia. That's the movement disorder. So normal flies will just climb up on the ball of the culture vials, and these mutant flies don't do that. So actually, it seems to work the same, both in human patients and in, in fruit flies. So the next short topic I'm going to mention is about another ATG gene called ATG16 and its function in the gut. Now, many researchers are interested in this because ATG16 in humans uh, has a mutation which predisposes to inflammatory bowel disease, meaning that if you have this mutation, you have a much higher chance of developing Crohn's disease than if you don't, right? And it, it seems clear that there are defects in, in specialized cells in the gut called Panet cells. Here you can see Panet cells stained uh, purple in, in a normal gut of a mouse. And all these purple dots represent panet granules. And in an ATG16 mutant mouse, or in human patients, you see much fewer of these granules. So these granules con contain antimicrobial peptides that, that control bacteria in our gut. And they also signal to stem cells when, when to divide and mature into, into other cells. So it seems to be some problem with these cells that secrete, that release these substances. So we then went on and generated ATG16 mutant flies. And first we looked for inflammation of the gut. And it, there was a clear signature of inflammation evidenced by uh, increased uh, antimicrobial gene activity. Okay? So then we looked at cells in the gut. This is a very simple scheme. Uh, showing how cells develop in the gut. There are intestinal stem cells that divide and some of them, most of them, will mature into cells called enterocytes, which, which absorb the food from the gut. Okay? But some of the cells mature into secretory cells, which are similar to Panet cells. They produce antimicrobial peptides, and they also talk to stem cells, whether they should divide or not. And we have markers for these cells. These are the green cells here. And these are the red cells. Both immature and mature secretory cells are labeled with red. And if you look at the gut of a wild-type fly, you see separate green and red cells, right? Mostly. 
When we deleted the part of ATG16 that's important for autophagy, we saw the same. But when we deleted another part of ATG16, which is actually not important for autophagy, what we saw that there were lots of cells that are both red and green, meaning that there is some problem with these immature cells into maturing into uh, differentiated secretory cells. And uh, yeah, actually, we think it's important. Um, the editors of this journal, where it was published last month, uh, decided to, to uh, uh, write an accompanying highlighting paper to our work because possibly this type of inflammatory bowel disease is a sort of developmental disorder. There is a problem with the maturation of secretory cells. It's not just you have a bad infection and you develop disease. And this is going to be the last topic of my talk, several short stories. Um, so we are very interested in learning how different vesicles unite, how they fuse together, how they fuse with the lysosome, because we are interested in lysosomal degradation pathways. And we know the usual factors that are involved in, in uh, making vesicles fuse with each other, uh, which was also worth a Nobel Prize uh, four years ago to just work out the, the general scheme of vesicle fusion uh, during the secretory pathway. So there are proteins, so-called snare proteins. These are li these little rods uh, on the surface of different vesicles. And when they are close enough to each other, they will just twist around each other. And they, they compress the two vesicles so hard that they will unite. So that's the fusion reaction. There is also another uh, factor, the tethering protein or tethering complex, which binds to both vesicles and holds them together. It gives time for the vesicles to, to unite, fuse. And the third uh, type of factors are so-called small GTPases, which are on the surface of these vesicles. They actually bind usually to the tethering uh, complex uh, to help hold these vesicles together, and they also uh, establish vesicle identity, right? So the cell must know which vesicles to fuse each other and which should not unite. And these proteins are very important for that. So a number of years ago, uh, through large-scale genetic approaches, we have identified, uh, well, basically these types of factors that are involved in autophagosome lysosome fusion. So we found the snare protein that's on the surface of autophagosomes, and it is required for autophagosome lysosome fusion. And if you disrupt that, then the flies will have neurodegeneration, ataxia, movement disorder, and short lifespan, just like the autophagy mutants. We also found the tethering protein called HOPS, which bind to the, binds to this, uh, this uh, snare and helps uh, vesicle fusion. And we found, surprisingly, not one, but two of these small GTPases in two separate works, suggesting that the actual fusion reaction is not symmetric, it's asymmetric, and it requires different factors on each, which is, of course, should be the case if different vesicles uh, unite. So this is about orophagosome lysosome fusion. Um, so how about other types of uh, vesicle fusions to lysosomes. There was a complex very similar to HOPS, another tethering complex, which was called Corvette, like the car. So Corvette uh, is also present in flies, yeast, and, and mammals. Uh, so we disrupted Corvette using genetic manipulation in flies. And we saw some defects with endosome and phagosome lysosome fusion. So I'm just going to show you one example. Here is one blood cell, essentially a macrophage, uh, from a normal fruit fly. And this, this blood cell is full of fluorescently labeled bacteria. And these bacteria that are green in this image are already in lysosomes. Lysosomes are purple because you can see the overlay, which is white. But when we disrupt Corvette, all of a sudden what we see that here is a blood cell. It's loaded with green bacteria. But these bacteria never go to the, to the purple lysosomes. So this other complex is important for, for uh, phagocytosis. 
And coming back uh, to the last slides, so, and to this old textbook image, we had all of phagosome, lysosome, phag phagosome, endosome, lysosome fusion. So how about secretory vesicles? This is crinophagy. So this process was uh, described uh, in 1966, and the degradation of these excess or unnecessary uh, secretory vesicles that carry hormones, enzymes, antimicrobial peptides, anything that the cell releases to the extracellular space. All these cells use crinophagy to degrade some of them. And actually, crinophagy can contribute to disease as well, which I'm not going to explain now for the sake of time. So again, we studied this process in fruit flies in the salivary gland. And you can see the salivary gland of the fruit fly larva. This is a maggot. And here is the salivary gland. And here is uh, during metamorphosis. And the salivary gland doesn't all, only produce saliva to help ingesting the food. It also produces so-called glue granules just before metamorphosis. And when the glue granules are released by the salivary gland cells, the animal spits out the glue. And that's how it, it is attached to a solid surface. And then it stays there for five, ten days until it, it completes metamorphosis. And an adult fly emerges from the maggot. Right? But interestingly, not all uh, glue granules are released at this time point. So it was interesting to see what's happening with the others that remain in cells. So we developed various methods to, to follow what's happening with the remaining glue granules. I'm just showing you one example. Here we labeled these glue granules with a red and a, and a green molecule. Uh, the green one is sensitive to pH. It will lose its color uh, around pH 6. Lysosomes have a pH of about 5, right? So when, it, when this uh, molecule gets to the lysosome, it will lose its color. But the red molecule will retain its color because uh, it, it, it will only lose the color at pH 4. And you can see what's happening in salivary gland cells over time. Initially, all the glue granules contain both molecules, but over time they lose the green one, but the red one remains, right? Here's a higher mag image. So these are the green glue granules. These are normal granules. And these are the ones that are already acidic, right? Because they have lost the green color. And of course, the green ones uh, contain both colors. And if you have a problem with this process, then you will end up with, green, with granules that all have the green color, the green molecule. That's a very simple test. So we used this test and other tests to figure out, again, uh, which molecules are involved in glue granule, lysosome fusion. We found the snares, the small GTPases, the tethering complex. Of course, the proton pump that makes the lysosomes acidic. And actually, uh, next January, our paper will be published in the same journal where this crinophagy process was described 52 years ago. But now we have the first molecules involved in it. And actually, we are now working together with a journalist, a science writer from JCB, to, to write a highlight to our paper. And that was my last data slide. So now I'm going to thank uh, the various funding agencies who give us money for work, that's very important. And also the people in my lab who do the work, that's also very important. Thank you.